Aqui está aparecendo como transmitindo. Ok. Começou, Letícia. Boa noite, novamente. A gente teve um probleminha aí na transmissão. Uh, a Sandra gerou um novo link. Eu acredito que agora a coisa funcione tranquilamente. Tá? Uh, a gente... Uh, vou fazer novamente a apresentação. Aqui é boa noite, lá para os nossos palestrantes, convidados... É um bom dia, porque eles estão no futuro, né, 14 horas na frente da gente, tá? Uh, primeiro, quero apresentar o nosso convidado, o Herman, que é uh, argentino, atualmente está uh, trabalhando lá do outro lado do mundo, na Austrália, né, Sydney. ele tem 15 anos de experiência, é engenheiro de redes, trabalha com diversas linguagens e foi profissional, é profissional certificado pela Juniper Networks e uh, ministrou vários treinamentos para as uh, operadoras de telecom nas Américas, tá? Uh, o nosso outro convidado é o Leonardo, esse é brasileiro, né? É engenheiro desenvolvimento de, na área de desenvolvimento de redes, tem 12 anos de experiência, Uh, sempre trabalhou com automação de redes, telecoms, telecomunicações, segurança da informação. I think she dropped now. It looks like it. Um... Shall we, shall we start, or is the transmission going, or? All right, without further ado, I think we can, we can start our, our, our conversation here today. Um, Yeah, um, I'm going to be speaking English in, in um, given my, my colleague Herman here is, um, is also um, not very skilled with the Portuguese. So I reckon, um, I reckon we, can, we can have this, this conversation in, in English for, so he can, he can follow up, pitch in. And, and if, if, if you all, like if anyone has any questions or anything, Feel free to to ping us here. I think we have a chat where we can we can receive um, any questions that that you guys might have. So feel feel free to to interrupt us um, if you if you have if if you need to. Herman, do you wanna do you wanna say hi to the folks? Um, okay, right. Um, boa noite. Hi, this is Herman. Uh, well, Leticia already introduced myself, so let's. Uh, Let's just get started. And um, thanks everyone from, uh, for joining. Cool. So yeah, today we're going to be talking about a little bit of network automation, um, a little bit of the software tools that we have, what, it, what is network automation, like technologies and practices in, in automating networks. So, um, so yeah, like what is, when we when we were talking about network automation what is it exactly so the process of 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 automating networks is like having software to or software tooling to configure manage um test deploy um um physical or virtual um network devices so the idea behind it is to have like a a tool set of, of 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 software to to help you manage to help you manage a, usually a big network where you don't have like human scale to like you have too many devices or you have um, some critical critical applications running in the network that you need to reduce downtime and all that so the 
concept of of network automation is basically having this 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 set of tooling to to help you to help you drive to help you drive and operate the network whether it's scaling or operations um all those all those tasks should be should be um should be improved with 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 network automation so um overall we're aimed to improve you know efficiency and reduce human errors across uh, you know across the the network management process and also you know with all that you also reduce operational operational costs right so that's 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 the idea behind it so, so um it's uh it's mostly interesting because you're combining like as as we evolve on the on the network side as networks get you know bigger and more um uh, with increase increased complex complexity um it it gets it gets kind of hard for you to to have your team or to have you on, on your company to have to do every single task that you need on, on those devices. So let's say if you have more than, you know, like a thousand devices to manage, how, how are you gonna how are you gonna do that effectively if you have to go there, log into every device and you know perform the action. So that's that's where network automation comes to try to to help us improve the the kind of you know that kind of process, right? So <clears throat> right um so okay let's move on so why is it like you know why is it really important to to have those kind of to have to have those kind of tasks automated right so usually when you're managing a network you have you have several repetitive tasks and predictable tasks that that you that you know that you that you have to do it on a regular basis right so so especially you know speaking especially in terms of operations if you have a problem most of the of the the problems in networks like you can they can be resolved um following a particular workflow or a particular um a particular task so so it, it's so a lot of the problems they can be predictable. So um, and then then it makes you know it makes sense for you if you, if if you have to if you're gonna have to do that every day. That's the idea behind where the software comes in. So you go there, you create a an automated task that will will do that for you when it's needed. So it it's really good because. Um, it helps you reduce the drastically the reaction time when you have a problem. Um, it helps it helps um, reduce also the mitigation time for a problem. So when you um, when you have let's say an issue with a network device, instead of waiting and waiting for an engineer to go there, look, uh, you know log into his computer and then SSH the device and then perform, you know, think of the actions that th he's going to have to take and then action on the device. So you could have a set of tools to go there upon an alarm, upon an alert, go there and do that, that kind of task for you. So it's really, it's really, really on that sense. So it also, it, it also allows you to roll roll out configuration much much quicker so you, you can so you can um for example if you need to scale the network like like we had for example on covid19 for example we can it helps you scale the sorry I'm, am i still online Okay, I'm still online. Um, so, um, where where were I? Um, so yeah, it can it can help us it, it can help us deploy configuration faster because if you need to um, 
if you need to push new configuration to devices, let's say, let's take that example. If we need to configure that the thousand devices, how, how long would it take for a human to go there, log into thousand devices and then apply the code and check the configuration test? And what are even worse, like what are the odds that someone on that process actually makes a typo or a mistake or, you know, kind of have that have that issue there. So um, that's kind of that's that's kind of where network um, network automation is 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 very helpful, right? Um, it it allows you to be very effective when you're managing big networks, um, and as I mentioned before, it avoids um, it avoids you know it reduces the possibility of having a human error on the on that on that process like you, you, you're not gonna like i'm gonna talk about a few uh, disasters that we had um, um i'm gonna talk about a case that happened this year when <clears throat> when someone was making a configuration change in a big cloud provider and they um uh, they made a they made a mistake um and kind of dropped the whole network to the ground so um <sighs> Let me see. Okay, so that's that's where that's where this this is this is important, right? So when we talk about manual changes versus network automation, like I, uh, we we chose like a scenario to talk about that happened on July seventeenth of this year um, that happened with Cloudflare. Um, it it led them to an out like they, they had a network change I'll, I'll go into details in, in 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 just a sec but they they had an outage in in several locations across america europe and middle east middle east um where they dropped traffic like 50 percent of their traffic during 20 27 minutes um you know across across the globe so <clears throat> That's where you know that's 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 one kind of the problems that could could have been avoided with with network automation. So what happened with these guys? So um, the so they had a an issue you know a network event in 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 the United States between a you know in a back a backbone route between Newark and Chicago, um, and their their network networking team was was um, working on a mitigation to that congestion um, and you know part of that mitigation process they had to to go there um, and apply some configuration to to change to change the the, the routing po policy in one of the one of the routers so um, the guy had the guy had a like he was he was changing the configuration in the atlanta in the router in atlanta in the core router in atlanta and as by the time you know he he went there and apply applied a configuration um, manually like the engineer logged into the into the box and applied um a configuration to ignore the prefix uh, you know the prefix list from six site local so what what he intended to do is, was to remove, you know, this whole this whole group of configuration, um, not only this line. So what it means here is, so by the time he removed the this this first clause, the from clause, uh, this is from the from the actually from the from the configuration at the network device, right? So by the time he removed the the prefix list. All the all the routes from from that from that router they they started inheriting the rest here. So, and and the mistake was like by the time he he wasn't filtering. Okay, I just want to apply this set of rules, this local preference communities, to to this six site local group. By the time he removed this, so that that was the on the first part here. You can see. That that was where the the configuration was applied. They 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 disabled the the prefix list. By the time they did that, 
the this set of rules um, they started to to be global for for all the all the routes on that on that router and the, and this you know inside their backbone this you know I don't know how many of you are actually um, are actually familiar with BGP and 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 networking protocols but when you when you set your local preference at 200 like this 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 route is going to be preferable like the routes that have this attribute will be preferable um in, in over over the other on the backbone so going back to here um when they did that they they applied the configuration on the atlanta router um all the routers on the on the network started to prefer the atlanta route instead of having for, you know having the best route or the shortest path so they they were were already trying to mitigate a congestion a congestion um event and by the time that the engineer got there applied the configuration he applied the wrong configuration i'm not sure if it was a typo or if he was distracted or if he didn't know what he was doing so like that's that's um i don't think we're gonna know that um that router started to take all the traffic across the americas and europe so and that obviously didn't have the capacity for it which led to this 27 minute congestion um and then well it took them time to find okay what did we change what why this is this happening and then they had to evaluate read through the the changes that have been going on and 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 yeah like eventually 27 minutes later they, they seem to have found out and then and then they, they were able to mitigate the problem so like where is the point here and where is the learnings like if 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 this was a change that was made by a network automation this process of you know shifting the router and managing the traffic would have been previously reviewed by the team and approved or not like th th they would have a clear process they would have they would have it defined on a workflow and even better if they could have defined on um you know a software script where the software goes there we know what we need to change the software goes there it re it, you say okay i need the the attributes i need to shift the router x in atlanta and you just go there and apply the right configuration at the right time so this is one like just a minor example on on how this how how we could have network automation to to kind of to kind of help us there like if you if you look in a global in a global um in a global internet environment there's a lot of outages that are caused by 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 humans doing manual changes because like i i have i know that countless times i i, I was go through my career i was going to to make a manual change like something that i was sure that was going to work perfectly and then by the time i deploy the configuration everything goes goes haywire and i drop i i, I start to drop customer traffic so that's that's where that's where we have a lot of potential to to improve here so it's basically going away from that like that's where the industry is kind of kind of moving towards now like I'm going away from that i'm gonna configure the router myself to to apply the configurations that i need and and whatnot um, to having a set of tooling, software tooling to go there and, and do that for you in a much more controlled environment. Herman, anything to add so far that you'd like to add or we can, we're good to move? No, no, that, that, that's okay. It's an example of uh, how human errors um, can cause uh, issues in the working and uh, well, we're going to see how automation will um, mitigate that. Cool. Cool. All right. So um, that's that's one of the examples that we could. So um, just to wrap up, um, if we had the software to come here 
and remove the whole thing or disable the whole thing instead of disabling like just just a part of it um it would have it would have um it would have avoided the issue and we see that like truly we see that every day like the the, the amount of time the human human intervention or human um error cause um outages on on, on networks is is really high so okay let's talk about uh like a sample sample scenario um so on this very very simple topology like we, we we're gonna try to to discuss a little bit on like very simple scenario where we can um use um network automation to help us um to help us solve like networking problems so let's see so we have here like um router a that's connected to uh to, to an autonomous system here that's part of an, an autom autonomous system sorry um that this this as connected to two upstream as's here so this guy is can be your local provider in your city and he has like two like upstreams up, upstream provider that he uses to connect to the internet so in this case here let's imagine um this autonomous system has like i don't know um 500 customers connected to it and they are in a public holiday during or during school holidays and on that night in that on that particular night um one of the one of the one of one of his upstream providers start to to experience interface flaps on on the on the interface so let's see we see here the connect um connection between router a and router b start to to degrade um the the thing that we would need to do here is to go there remove this interface from service and just leave you know our our customers connecting to, to this to this healthy link here the, the other healthy link okay so yeah so like if, if this happens in business hours you, you're a network engineer you get an alert you're gonna go there you're gonna log into router a and then you're gonna shut the shut the link right so you're gonna that that's that's it's not a big of an issue if you have one router and you're just managing the router and you have nothing else to do you're just sitting there waiting for the link to have a problem you're gonna go there and you're gonna shut the link things are gonna be fine but life doesn't always work that way so the this link will likely ha uh, you know show issues on the weekend or during the night and let's assume it's during the night so you're gonna have you're gonna have to to you as being responsible for the router a you're gonna have to get paged or get an alert on your phone wake up in the middle of the night go there log into into the device like sleepy and maybe you were you you know you weren't you're in a party or something you had a few drinks and then you go there okay let me look to the configuration i'm gonna i need to shut interface serial zero okay and then it's just to you just need to apply the shutdown on that interface but let's see if you're in middle of the night you have to wake up you have to check if you're doing the right thing and then you, you you have a you have a high high risk of going to the wrong interface and showing oh instead of shutting serial zero i shut serial one and then the only link that i had that was working well is now shut down um and i you know instead of fixing the problem you made you made the problem worse so like we're gonna talk through a few examples that we could solve like how we could solve this problem using like well-known tools that we have on, on on the market today on the industry to kind of um help alleviate this so um yeah so that's you know if if you do it right it's it's pretty simple you just have to go there and to face serial zero and apply this shutdown this shutdown command and then you're good and and you save the configuration and move on but yeah 
like we need to make sure that we that we do it that we do it on the right on the right interface at the you know it you don't you don't screw it up and this is a very simple scenario as as complex complexity increases you have you're gonna have to look you're gonna have to think and then it takes time customer all that 500 customers that you have that was were watching netflix during the night or was trying to watch this you know some youtube or whatever they're gonna start to see their video drop and their connection to drop if, if you don't act fast, like until you have mitigated it. Um, all right, so, <clears throat> okay, so this is, so this is, um, this is the line that, that we, we would have to, to have applied on that case to, to fix, to fix the issue. So yeah, Let's talk about a few um, aut automation tools that we that we that we have that could have could have helped us potentially fix the problem. So, <clears throat> first of all, yeah, I just wanna um, we're gonna this is a few that we're we're gonna be talking about. So, like the the beginning of things, um, people used to. To automate tasks um, using shell scripts, you know, like Unix, Bash, and all that, and we also have this, you know, kind of expect command, it, which is, you know, very. Yeah. Yep. Sorry, um, are you in, are you showing the the right slide? Uh, I think at least me, I'm seeing the why is it important one. Uh, oh really? Yes. No, uh, I'm. I'm way on the, let me just check, um, let me just check, um, are you seeing automation tools slide? I don't know, like maybe I can reshare my screen or something. Okay, I think it's you, Herman. Okay. Anyway, let me let me do that it's again. To oh, good. Um, let me. Uh, I guess I'll share it again, or just move on, because you're gonna have to see the slides anyway. No, no. All right. Continue. Continue. Okay. Um, no worries. A lot of of, of tech tech problems today um okay so network automation tools um let me just see where i was open the... okay so back at the beginning um, we had um people started automating the tasks that they they have so i'm gonna talk we're gonna talk a little bit of detail of those um maybe some some future use as well so and then we have python um i don't know how many how many of you are actually familiar with python um it's a really really like a swiss knife um language these days you pretty much can do every, every, a lot of things in terms of scripting and you know if you like um, backend programming it's, it's it's really it's really a handy, a handy tool a handy tool to, to have knowledge on and we're going to be talking a little bit of about that and then we're going to move on to ansible which is uh um it's okay I, can I continue or is it an issue? Okay, I'm continuing. So is it me? What? Is it me then? Maybe? Okay, let's, okay, I'm, I'm continuing. Um, so then we have Ansible, uh, Ansible and Jinja, which is like funny name Jinja. Um, it's more like more robust 
tool um, where you have not only automation, the power to run scripts and deploy, generate and deploy configuration, but you're also going to have like um, inventory control and 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 be able to to manage the you know kind of a, a tip to tail management of the network. And then we have netconf, which is net configuration, which is like a protocol that we, that have has been developed to help you develop your own script and deploy to router. So you can understand a little bit of, of those as, as we as we talk through. Um, okay, so the first the first example that we have is like having you know going back to that 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 shut interface thing so here we have the most rudimental and basic um script that we could have to kind of fix fix that problem so what what does it do like it's a shell script that you have on your on your linux on your unix box that will pretty much read stuff from a from a pipe like from a from an ssh a telnet connection and based on what it what it reads it's gonna uh, you know echo back some some text to to apply on the computer so on the on the device so let's see what's what's interesting here about this so i believe people should be able to see my mouse um so here we we would have like okay i'm gonna define a few variables like the ip address that i that i'm trying to connect i'm gonna take that from arc v0 the first argument on the on the shell on the on the um, on the shell and then i'm gonna define also an interface that i want to shut and i'm gonna take that as a second second argument on the bash and i'm gonna have it hard coded my username my password for that device i'm gonna set like a directory for logs that i wanna you know record this kind of session um and then i'm gonna start you know connecting connecting to to ssh so that's oops that's the first that's the first thing i i, I would like to do here so as by the time I, I start this SSH process, the the, the expect um, paradigm would be waiting. Okay, I I started, so I need to read something. So and the, and the and the programmer or the network engineer would have to see. Okay, the first thing I'm expecting to read from that connection is, is like a a password, kind of with a P, a capital P, or or or, or a normal P. So I'm gonna be expecting to read that from, from the output on this CLI. So then once I read that, I'm gonna send the variable that we have defined as being the password, and then I should have uh, a successful connection to that router. Um, and then I, I should see, I should see um, a shell um, showing me that this actually has been um, a successful connection and then i have to start sending the sending the command to go in through the com into the configuration mode into the router and then i expect to see a configure you know a confirmation that we actually have gone in through the configuration mode and then i have to go into the to the interface configuration mode so i'll send the common interface and then the variable with the interface name that we we got from the beginning, and then again I have to confirm if I if I if I was successfully if I went successfully in that com interface configuration mode, and then at only then I can send the shutdown command that we saw before. So right, so remember here we wanted to go into interface serial zero and send the shutdown command. So. Um, and then at this point, um, we would have fixed the, the problem. And then I still need to continue because I need to save the configuration. I need to exit and then I need to write everything to the log. So after we shut the configuration, we need to, to, to check if we have the, the, the configuration shell back again. Then we send the first exit. 
we go we then go back to the global configuration mode and then exit again and then we finally check if the we're in the in the global shell and then we write it to the to the persistent memory of the router so it, you know it's if anything goes wrong here on the script you're gonna you're gonna have the uh, your whole like your 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 automation task blown blown to the skies because it's not gonna work if you if you change like if you update the firmware on that router and for some oops for some reason this the icon that that shows you that you're on the shell changes for whatever it's not going to work anymore or if you fail to go into the configuration mode you, you uh, in the interface configuration mode your script is going to crash or it's going to hang there it's not going to complete because you're not reading the expected the expected output on that on that um on that device so this is like the most basic you can have in terms of in terms of automation um and you know there's a lot of clear drawbacks here you cannot like it's based on that uh, parsing reading and you don't have a really good programming language to support you to get that data from the router you have to keep parsing text and working with strings in a weird way and if things go slightly out of out of the out of the you know what's expected to, to, to be the output your 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 script is definitely gonna break. Um, yeah and this this is this is like one of the, the drawbacks but I in theory like not in theory if if you if you're looking of implementing something very simple this kind of does does the job yeah but it's very kind of yeah it's not definitely not my favorite way of doing things herman anything to add there uh well let's say that this is the like the starting point of automation like yeah. initially this is a manual task and i want to you know generate a script to to do a thing for me so this was the let's say first iteration so we're gonna see what's uh, what the new in technologies came to to improve on this correct um <clears throat> and then like yeah this is the as you said the, the the first baby steps on that automation head this is quite old like i reckon the expect command has been there since since forever in in unix systems um yeah um okay and then we have um python which um yeah i would be very keen to know how many people know python and how many people doesn't but i guess in the current setup it's kind of hard to you know bump those questions around so yeah i'm just going to talk a little bit of what it is and what kind of language we're talking about and and then we can take it from there so um yeah so it's um so in this case here w w you know python is you know this in interpreted high level general purpose programming language it it, it it's not very like it's not super new. I think it's from the early '90s. It, it has been it has been developed, and um, it's really focused on code readability. And it tries to. It's a language that it tries to to go as to go as a human language, not a computer language. Instead of like if you compare it to C, for example, it's going to be very very different, and it, it's very easy. To, to learn um if you, if you're new to programming it's very very good to 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 start with python it, it can like it abstracts a lot of things for you and um it not only had like heaps of of documentation online and you can just um go there and 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 and, and learn a lot from python it also um supports like several um programming paradigm paradigms um like um oh, what was it called um like uh, procedural, procedural yeah. yeah procedural 
object oriented and also um, functional programming it's 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 called it's it's what a mixed uh, um, mixed type correct you so can, you can do you can, procedural, yeah. yeah you can do a lot of a, a lot of things from um with it um so that's why like it's a swiss knife in terms of 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 programming languages nowadays and it's a it's a very strong standard in the in the industry at the moment like most of the of the big companies are are building building their tooling building their network automation in in on top of python these days cool so um yeah let's talk about the script so as python is very um you know as i mentioned it there's it's a very well defined language that is industry standard and there's a lot of libraries and 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 different things that you can connect together and if you think of something okay i could be doing this with python that's probably a library or a package out there that does half of the job for you already so on our case like we're going to be talking about this net miko um net micro net miko i don't know how people are spelling these these days but yeah anyway um so it kind of um abstract all that part that we were talking about like like talking to the router going through the the different stages of configuration so here it's much more organized so i have a i'm defining the device so we're we're gonna create a dictionary about like with the host and if I if I want to go fancy, I can use like my YAML records, or I can have this on a SQL database, or in a database where I can just query on my script and then build my configuration. So it's it starts to look at something more professional. So then you're gonna have a gonna have to have a dictionary with okay, this device I'm connecting to is a Cisco IOS um, on the IP X Y Z, um, and I'm going to have like probably I can have a repository of username and password um, and, and all that. And I'll, I can also specify which interface I'm playing with. And then on Python, we're going to have we can instantiate an object to, to, to handle the connect to handle the connection with the with the with the router. Um, and then, for example, OK, start the, the object. The Python, the backend will do the, the connection for you, okay, with with based on the parameters that you have specified. And then we just have to send, okay, and this I'm going fancy because okay, I I I, I want to collect the logs from the device first and, and save it on my logs to see that that if like how many times that interface was flapping per minute or something like that. Like I can get statistics from it. So first thing I do, I get all the logs, like show logging from the device that's the command and include the, the interface that we're talking about. So that's gonna be my, you know, my my basic, my basic um, get log thing. So I'll get everything that has been happening on that interface. And then I save this to the log in a log file or whatever. Um, and then I, then I start the mitigation. Okay, so I, I'm gonna create a list of commands that I that I that I intend to show to send to the router. Um, on this case, I'm just gonna use like a simple um, a one a one value. But I could let's say if I wanted to shut like multiple interfaces, I could just loop through this list and then shut multiples at time. And then I just say that I I need to send okay configuration commands i'm gonna append so interface blah shut down so that's what i'm gonna be sending to the cisco and and then the the library already does that for us so i just need to use that that function to say send configuration set and and it's gonna do the whole back to back for you go go remember go into the configuration mode go to to the interface configuration mode so it does everything for you and it saves so and it will probably it will raise an exception where you can treat the exception and you know branch your coding your code your automation code accordingly to that exception 
which is you know which is really really like cool to have this empower like remember here if you had if you have anything going wrong it was just just gonna blow up but here now like you're in python you're in a in a or uh, object oriented language you can branch the code you can move the code you can make fancy decisions on depending on what did you read from the router and and what you want to do okay and then i write the commands that i have executed on on the on the log as well just have the consistency on the on the changes anyway that's a little bit about python i think we um move on now um if anyone has questions just please yeah ask now it's on you herman ansible fancy stuff all right um so um now, um um, I want to talk about a little bit of about orchestration, uh, which is something that is um, very related to networking automation. So, what is orchestration? Let's say coming back. Uh, so, at the beginning of ages, uh, everything was manual. People were just running commands on a CLI. Then someone came up with the idea to automate this. Started with a shell script, then developing into. Um, um, expect uh, expect commands or Python. So let's say now we have a lot of scripts uh, that uh, that do several things, several different tasks that we need in our network, uh, and that those scripts are designed to different different types of networking elements and also uh, hardware um, server elements. Um, so um, at, at this point, we are in a point that the networking operations consist of executing different scripts, given the scripts different parameters, okay? Um, but as uh, networks grow and the automation develops, um, it, uh, we need a, a way to um, orchestrate. And what, what, is, what is orchestrate? Instead of running manually running and giving the inputs to all the scripts that we have, um, we want a centralized system where we know what is called our network inventory, uh, consisting of all the network elements that we have and what, what are the tasks of those um, elements and what kind of tasks can be run on different elements. Um, and then all the different tasks and a way to automatically or um, let's say, um, yeah, giving some certain parameters, run automatically the scripts with the automatic um, parameters that we need. So uh, let me give you an example of this, uh, and then I talk about Ansible, which is basically an open source tool uh, for doing this, for doing that what is called orchestration. Let's say we, we have a um, virtual host um, service, which consists, let's say, in different um, servers with, uh, with, with some virtualization software, then layer two switches, and I, I'm not sure if you're familiar with these networking concepts, but let's say one one sort of uh, switch on the network, and then layer layer three that was called routers. So let's say uh, we we have a task which is creating a new a new service, which will consist in creating on the on the layer three device a new interface, then enable a certain billion in, on all the layer level two um, devices. And finally, on the servers, um, create the, again the, the new interface and setting up something. So uh, we, what we, we what we have just learned, what Neil uh, discussed, we can we can have a script for the layer three device, scripts for the layer, layer two devices, scripts for the servers, and uh, once we need have a new let's say a new customer or a new connect request, we need to configure everything. So we we will need to run. The script, the different scripts on different elements. With uh, network orchestration, with Ansible, what what we what we have is first an inventory, and in the inventory, um, it, it's defined uh, different groups of devices, and different tasks that can be run on those devices. So, uh, given that we have then different playbooks, which basically the, the playbooks are um, YML um, documents which said, um, do this to this kind of devices, these other tasks to other kind of devices, and so on. So basically, we will have a playbook for, let's say, create this. The playbook will have all the 
have some inputs, let's say, in this case, I don't know, bill and ID, let's say maybe customer ID, or all the information needed, and then it will have different tasks depending on different um, um, network element types to run on different um, elements. So uh, this way, <coughs> we don't need to manually run the different scripts, but all, just uh, run the orchestrator, and the orchestrator will run all the scripts, all the corresponding scripts on all the um, networking elements uh, that we need, right? So that's um, basically um, orchestration. There are several uh, tools, but uh, Ansible is um, pretty much uh, the, in, in the open source um, part, let's say, in the open source segment is the pretty much a, a de facto standard nowadays on what is uh, IT orchestration. Okay. So uh, moving forward, um, related to orchestration and something is very uh, heavily used in, in Ansible and outside is what we call uh, templating. Um, what is templating? Basically, with the examples that we have seen uh, with our scripts, we manually created the networking commands or the networking configuration uh, that we need, right? <clears throat> So, um, templating allows us to uh, programmatically generate the, uh, the commands or the configuration that we need in a much more uh, forward way. Because um, typically, let's say we are doing this in raw Python. Um, so, we we'll have we'll run different you know, string manipulation um, um, functions or uh, code to come up with, with the with the configuration that we need given our parameters so instead of doing that again and again and again uh, there, there are templating engines which allow us to define um, the output that we need in a much uh, um, straightforward way again the, the the de facto standard right now for the working automation is Shinsha. Shinsha is a templating language which is based to base uh, in Python so basically, what it is is it's a, you, you generate a um, text file in which you embed Python Python syntax. It's not exactly as Python, but let's say the syntax of Shinsha is based on Python. Okay, so um, basically here here we have a um, an example. This is let's say the, the same example um, that, uh, uh, that we were talking about. We need to uh, shut down an interface on a, on a, on a Cisco type um, device. And let's say uh, we have um, an interface type and an index. So um, basically this is how, how it's done. This is just a, the Jinsha uh, template, which then, um, for example, Ansible or um, the Ansible task will pick up this uh, template and replace the interface type and interface index with the input that we give and it will generate the, the configuration that is needed. Then the configuration will be deployed using um, the, the Ansible models on the, let's say, Cisco device. Um, here's another example. Um, this one is for creating a new um, BGP, uh, BGP connection, right? So it's very similar. Um, Basically, we will replace in the in, in this uh, small configuration snippet all the parameters that we have here. We have local um, autonomous system number, BGP neighbor, remote autonomous system number, um, and well, uh, the same parameters that are repeated again. So this is the part of the configuration that we need to uh, send to again a, a Cisco type uh, device. So uh, yeah. This is basically what um, templating is, uh, is about. Um, Leo, do you want to add something uh, regarding templating or orchestration? Yeah, um, just quickly. And well, on this on this format, you you would have not like we're moving away from that standalone scripting that we've been talking about, and it's more like on a Ansible eco ecosystem where 
you you have it everything on the set on on the central um, database. So Ansible is a very as Herman was saying, it's a very big um, environment where you can do like heaps of things, like different things. Um, and the templating is very good because um, it you, you you can use multiple attributes that you already have in the in the backend database um, as like is everything already connected? Like there are predefined. Um, variables that you can use to specify host names or IPs that you want to connect and all that. So that's that's where like it's much more comprehensive system instead of going into into pure Python or other 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 things that, that we we discussed. Yeah, no that, that was it. Shall we move to netconf? Oh we, we have a question here from Arthur uh, he's, he's asking for a, for a practical uh, example. So first, uh, um, a little thing about Shinsha and Ansible that maybe is not clear. So although Shinsha is very related to Ansible, they are separate things. So you may as well use Shinsha without Ansible. Let's say you can rewrite the script that, that you presented uh, using Python, using uh, the Shinsha, uh, Shinsha. So instead of just one one big uh, Python script, we have the Shinsha template on one side, and then you can call the template, you call it the, the, the Shinsha, let's say, um, translator with the input and use that instead of using the whole Shinsha orchestration. Now, uh, uh, get, getting back to, to Ansible. So I, I, I'm gonna try to better explain the, the example that I, I already given, um, but uh, maybe we can come up with, with, with a new one. More important than the example is uh, the concept that I was speaking at the beginning. Um, without, let's say, without Ansible, just with um, basic scripting, once we have, let's say, everything automated, so we don't we don't need to go in manually on any device. We have one script for every task that we need. But then, what we will need to do uh, as a day-to-day -day operation is basically running those scripts. Maybe running them from, a, let's say, from the CLI or running them from, from some sort of front end, something. But uh, we will need to say, let's say, call this script, let's say, shutdown interface, that, like the script that we were talking, that we were our example. Run this script on this particular host uh, with these particular parameters. So basically, we are, we are changing the manual um, CLI intervention for a not so manual um, script, right? But now taking into account that we have a very big uh, network, let's say we have you know, several data centers, that, that each data center consists of thousands of uh, server hosts, let's say virtual, um, virtual server application hosts. Um, then we have hundreds of layer two uh, switches and dozens of layer, layer three switches, right? And let's say we have a task, which is basically um, deploy a new, uh, let's say a new instance for a for a, um, a virtual a virtual machine, but uh, several virtual machines across our data center. So things that we need to do first: configure the virtual hosts to create the new virtual uh, the virtual machines. Those virtual machines will have a specific uh, VLAN, let's say, or a specific, so if you don't know what VLAN is, a specific subnetwork on a layer two. Then we need to uh, generate that interface on, on the virtual host. Then on every layer two uh, device, uh, they need to know about this new, this new VLAN and allow it to, to go through. And then on the layer three devices, we need the corresponding interfaces that will talk to this new uh, virtual LAN of this, let's say, new new application or, or new customer. So if you're just using scripts, we will have to run, let's say, maybe five or six several uh, different scripts, and one of, one of them we will have to run against thousands of devices, and we will need to come up with a list of devices where we need to run the script, run the script, and that again, starts, starts to, to be error prone if it's um, done manually, right? What, what the orchestration does is 
instead of doing all that, the inventory uh, of all our networking devices, and with the inventory, we have the networking type. So when we, uh, instead of um, doing this manually, we have playbooks. So let's say we have a playbook which is create a new uh, virtual instance. Or de let's say rather than create, deploy new um, virtual instance with another parameters. Let's say, for example, which DC, which kind of services needs, etc. Right? But oh, with all these par this, um, these parameters, the orchestration infrastructure, let's say Ansible, will generate all the tasks and will run all the scripts that are needed across all the different uh, networking devices. So basically, and then this is something I, I forgot to mention. Uh, Ansible, it's, it's basically a backend, but we have a, a lot of front ends, or even this could be connected to other business logic. Factor, um, I mean, in, in a business, let's say we have a our new, new customer um, platform. So uh, we have a new customer. The new customer purchases something. Automatically, it gets paid, and then it runs. Uh, let's say with a REST, RESTful API or something. It, it will call our orchestration, and our orchestration automatically will deploy all the scripts and, uh, uh, to generate the new, uh, the new service, right? Instead of manually having to run uh, different scripts. So I don't know, what's the example? Uh, um, is it understood? Uh, any other further questions? Uh, good. Arthur? Yeah, that was a good one, I guess. Uh, shall we wait for feedback here on the chat? <laughs> can we continue? Yeah. This, I this think we can topic. continue and then maybe revisit in the yeah, end if we, there is further questions. We, yeah. We will have time. We will have time for questions, right? Yeah. Yeah, I guess so. Okay. So netconf. Okay, let's go with netconf. So. Cool. Uh, why, what is the what is it come from? What, what, why is it here? Why, what's the purpose of it? So uh, all the examples that we were talking about uh, so far, if you uh, look at it, what we have is um, CLI commands or configuration statements, which are originally meant for humans, right? And what we are doing is trying to have software scripts or orchestration or whatever. Uh, try and go and do the same thing that a human would do, but automatically. So that that would have a, a several drawbacks um, uh, when when trying to do it um, automatically, which is basically um, the um, the commands and all the let's say the, the the structure of the information that goes uh, the from the scripting to the devices, and this vice versa um, is structured for human reading. And what it means is that it can change, and it's uh, difficult to keep up with the changes and to parse uh, from a um, software or programming point of view. Right. So let's say we we need to run a we we have a script that I don't know will uh, grab some information from the device. Let's say the status of uh, BGP peerings. So the, the CLI command will present us with a table uh, in a, in a no, ASCII format. Um, and our um, automation script, let's say using expect, for example, or, or NetMeek or something, will try to parse that. And you know, basically with the string manipulation um, code, uh, we'll have, we'll try to you know convert uh, whatever strings to to decimal or, or whatever, and, um, and grab the information from there. Then, if there's changes in the way that that information is presented, let's say from one uh, software release to the other, or maybe with uh, slightly different models of devices, then the script need to have that in, take that into account, uh, and it's you know difficult to maintain. Again, error prone and, and such. So as automation began to grow, uh, you know, networking engineers and software developers were worried about this and uh, come up with different kind of uh, protocols, let's say presentation protocols, uh, that are meant to um, allow software automation tools talk directly uh, to um, networking devices. 
the the most um, uh, the most used one is netconf With, what is netconf it's basically a restful api based in xml for sending and receiving information uh, to a to a device but what this will do instead of our sending um, strings or text-based configuration or commands we are sending xml so we the um, the networking vendors will uh, give us a schema with all the different XML uh, documents that we can send and receive and how they are structured. So uh, the networking, uh, the automation tools will now use this instead of text. Obviously, what, what, what's the, the advantage? XML, it's, uh, it, it's a, let's say, a presentation protocol that is easily understand and parsed by software, so it will reduce, as long as the XML schema uh, is the same, all our, all our networking um, automation tools uh, is gonna continue work, to work. Um, so basically that's, that's the idea behind the conf. It's important to, be, to take it into account. Say for example, networking um, uh, vendors like, like Juniper, for sure, Cisco, they um, they use uh, they they provide a netconf API, so and also all the um, libraries for for Python um, Ansible plugins, for example, and everything based on this. Right. So uh, for automation of such devices, we typically use uh, this XML instead of uh, plain text. Right, this is basically what I think regarding NetConf. Um, Leo, do you want to add something? Uh, regarding no, I think, yeah, I think I'm good actually. Um, yeah, really good. Ooh. I think I think it was pretty clear. So, the last thing we want to discuss is uh, looking a little bit, uh, just touch a little bit on the surface uh, about what is uh, SDN, which is something that, like, let's say, it's the next step uh, after networking uh, automation. So before, before talking about what, what SDN is, um, I want to explain a, a little bit of the architecture of networking devices uh, right now and since like maybe you know, 30 years from now. Uh, every networking device, basically the architecture is the same. Uh, we'll have what is called a control plane and a data plane. The control plane is almost always um, uh, no server uh, um, server unit based uh, typical uh, hardware, um, and the data plane is typically ASICs. So what what this means? The control plane is the brains, let's say, of the device. It will run all the um, networking protocols. And it will communicate, for example, it will present the CLI to us. If it's netconf, it will present netconf to us. Uh, and um, typically, it's connected to, uh, to a network separated from the, from the production network, which is typically called the management network. Uh, the control plane uh, talks to the data plane, typically also over some sort of uh, networking uh, in, inside the, the same uh, Edward device chassis, right? And basically say to the data plane exactly what it needs to do with packets, right? So the data plane that knows nothing about uh, networking protocols or parameters or, or nothing at all, just a uh, um, forward, what is called forwarding tables, which basically says, let's say it's uh, it's uh, layer three, so IP routing, you will say this prefix, if it comes from this interface, you forward it to this interface, and so on. Now that they have different um, data planes with different features, have different uh, things. So, for example, if it's a firewall, it will have features by for filtering, you know, uh, more upper layer things like HTTP or something. But basically, it's that. So it has no no intelligence, and it is implemented in uh, what's called ASICs. Let's say uh, purpose specific hardware. Uh, that it's um, designed to forward uh, packets efficiently um, and, and so on. So what we're doing with, with network automation right now, uh, all, all the examples that we were talking about uh, during uh, 
this uh, conversation is they're talking to the control plane, basically um, altering parameters or you know moving some knobs with the networking protocols. Let's say disable this uh, OSPF interface, change this parameter, and then the control plane with the parameters that we just give to, to it will then program the forwarding uh, part to uh, implement uh, what we do. So in the latest years, several uh, developments uh, happened in the, in the industry. Um, one important one is the, that the ASICS uh, hardware is beginning to be more and more a commodity, right? Uh, so ba back in the, let's say, the 80s, uh, different uh, networking vendors, they will have their own ASIC very close, very you know, um, private. So nobody really knew what 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 is the ha the forwarding hardware. Nowadays, the the forwarding hardware, the, the the ASICs, is trying to commoditize. So basically, a lot of different devices from a lot of different vendors. At the end, they will have the same kind of ASICs running the data plane. So this allows what allows to in, instead of using the, the vendor specific control plane, use another control plane, or not using a control plane at all. So we come to something that is called SDN. So what is, is the SDN? Instead of having a, a control plane, we'll have just a small SDN uh, controller uh, stack in the device, and all the intelligence come away from the device chassis to a software uh, uh, SDN, SDN controller, which is basically a software-based centralized uh, brain, let's say. So instead, from, from the automation of, from the software, instead of just uh, giving parameters to the control plane, or now um, shutting an interface, enable a new BCP protocol or something like that, we directly instruct the forwarding plane what it needs to do with the buckets, right? So this opens a whole new um, set of you know, um, tools, set of uh, opportunities, uh, especially for uh, um, developers, uh, right? Uh, back in the day, there was networking engineer and software development, and there were uh, two separate things. Right now, they are starting to to be uh, to blend to be. Same thing because more and more than working is controlled by by software. So, uh, what um, what can be done with this? Basically, um, we have networking monitoring, and this collects data from the network: utilization, packet drops, uh, every every kind of uh, information that you want. And it, this is used as an input by the uh, SDN controller. And the SDS controller reacts to this and uh, changes the, the the instructions for the let's say the forwarding tables, etc., for the forwarding for the data plane. Um, another uh, very interesting application on this is security. Right, um, when we have security using SDN, the the SDN can have you know um, very smart analytics to uh, detect uh, sophisticated attacks uh, across a network. So in the, in the legacy idea, we will have separate uh, firewalls that they will be analyzing the, the data that goes through each device separately. Using a centralized uh, software-defined uh, network, we can have information across all the networking devices this will this allow us to to detect uh, sophisticated attacks like distributed attacks and so on and this can uh, use can be used to react let's say for example blocking a certain um, <clears throat> blocking certain uh, certain prefixes from certain uh, places uh, and so on and in the latest uh, time something interesting that uh, is beginning to to be uh, analyzed is um, using, uh, so the monitoring of the network is beginning to draw more and more data, and this could be used to use uh, big data, for example, and deep learning to um, take 
more uh, complex decisions across uh, the network, even um, predicting, for example, scaling and, and this and another kind of, of stuff that usually needs a human to be analyzed. But the more and more uh, artificial intelligence is, is developed, uh, SDN gives an opportunity to directly plug uh, artificial intelligence into the network. Uh, so yeah, what you're saying? Is there information transition behind? Sorry, I'm. I'm yeah, I think question. we have a question there. Yeah, is there an international yeah. organization behind it trying to create rules for each layer from Fernando? Um, I'm not um, sure what are the layers in this context because I, I didn't read the the, the the question when it was asked. So which layers are we talking about now? Yeah, I'm not sure. Um, can Fernando clarify, maybe? It's going to take a while for it to get to him. <laughs> I guess so. So if, uh, if we're talking about this, the end, there are several organizations. Uh, and there's a software-defined network foundation, which is basically uh, a place where different uh, People that are working on this and organizations get together, try to to create new protocols um, and the such. So the, this uh, we're not gonna go deep into that. There are new protocols that they are competing right now, uh, but there's this uh, software network organization foundation. They are trying to to define if we're talking about uh, SDN. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, and this well, this would be the time where we open for for questions anyway. Um, yeah. Do you have something else to add on SDN, Herman? Or no, no, no. I was about to say that. Uh, just um, I read the the first question. So yeah, we are on the question and answer time. Is there any other questions that would like to submit? Acho que tem mais aqui a interação do Fernando. Um. You're talking about network automation, I guess, cloud network plus user network. Ah, okay. So, yeah, so I would say, like, talking about cloud specifically is, like, this is something that, that would run on the back end. Like, if you think about it, there, like, if you think about the concept of cloud, there, there is you know there's no such thing as abstract as cloud networking like in the end of the day you're gonna have a server virtual server in, in an instance running somewhere on the world in a data center in a physical hardware so the the cloud is pretty much like a commercial name i would say um and that you know but the, you, you always, if, if it's on the cloud, it's somewhere on someone's data center, in someone's computer, hard drive, com, you know, server with processors, memories, as just like as you would have on your home. So that's that, you know, and the network automation, like it, it would apply to, to the network that supports what we say, like cloud thing. So that's, you know, the network is is the is the highway to get to get you from your home to the to the destination where your your data or your application is living, and yeah, the, so that the idea behind it is to have like this orchestration or automation to make sure that we maximize the availability of those highways or that you know that the network in between you and the the data where it, the location where your data is living. I'm not sure if I got the question right now. Do you want to add something there, Herman? 
No, not really. Um, let, let's wait to, to see the, if it's um, if your answer is clarified because may, maybe uh, Fernando is uh, referring to something else, like um, like the networking between the, the, between um, virtual uh, virtual machines or containers, uh, Kubernetes. Ah, okay. Got it. Thanks. <laughs> Perfect. Uh, agradecemos a presença e a participação, o compartilhamento do conhecimento dos nossos convidados, Herman e Leonardo, é de grande valia em tempos de isolamento social, as pessoas estão usando muito a questão da rede, né, então uh, as empresas precisam estar mais preparadas e melhor, uh, auto, com automação vai facilitar bastante o trabalho dos engenheiros de rede, né? Gostamos muito aí da palestra de vocês, da, da presença de vocês, e se uh, não tivermos mais nenhuma pergunta, pode falar até para o pessoal, né? Se quiserem perguntar em português, pode, pode ser também, pode? <risos> Paulo? quiser colocar alguma pergunta em português ali para gente, mas por enquanto nada. Então, agradecemos aí a presença uh, de todos os ouvintes e em especial aos dois jovens aí, Herman e Leonardo. Muito obrigada. Tenham um bom dia a vocês e a gente aqui tem uma boa noite. Encerrado. Não. All right. Obrigado. Bye, folks. Obrigado. Obrigado para todos.